Welcome to the Style and Vibes Podcast with me, Michaela. I'll be giving you the inside scoop on music, fashion, culture, and more from Caribbean celebrities and tastemakers across the globe, pushing our culture with authenticity and, of course, style and vibes. Welcome, Rachel Osborne of Julie Mango TV. Julie Mango TV is a platform and lifestyle hub championing on-screen Caribbean storytelling. But I'll let Rachel you know, give her own overview of the thing as soon as we um, kind of get into this topic. So Rachel is an uh, aficionado when it comes to all things Caribbean film. So I know Small Acts came out a little while ago, but I still think the conversation is really relevant, um, especially from a diaspora perspective. So I invited Rachel onto the podcast today so we can talk and you're in, you're in, you guys are in for a treat because we are going to be talking about small acts over the next two episodes. So this one, we're going to kind of overview the project. And then the next one, we're going to get into, you know, one of my favorites in the series. Um, and we're going to dive deep into the Lo- Lover's Rock episode. So welcome, Rachel. Hi, thank you. I'm like- <laughs> <laughs> yes we can we have to the people them <laughs> so tell for so first of all tell us a little bit about you and why you started julie mango tv okay <laughs> this story um so julie mango started as an idea last year because i was doing some research on film criticism and just to see how it played out in a caribbean context and of course there was not a lot. So first of all, film criticism is very white male. Um, then I started digging deep into who are the black critics and I found a lot of black critics in uh, North America, but they were focusing on Hollywood film, right? So there's no one place, there was no one place we did that. There was no one place where it was all about just Caribbean film. Even the, the blogs and the different websites and platforms that you see for Caribbean entertainment, those platforms are heavily music focused because music moves a little bit faster. There's a lot more things to write about. So although they may cover some film and some culture, they really focused heavily on music. And I'm like, okay, I think that there will be value in creating a space where it's just for film so that when filmmakers are working on their publicity for their product projects, they have at least one place where they can go to say, okay, this is dedicated to my audience, an audience that I know is already interested in Caribbean film, because it's hard as a filmmaker with no budget, um, when marketing kind of is like at the end, kind of afterthought sometimes, because you don't even have money, you spend all most of your budget on making a film, it's hard for filmmakers to then say, okay, um, I'm going to invest into a publicist, right? So, Yes, they can reach out to the Gleaner if they're in Jamaica. Yes, they can reach out to Loop if they're across the Caribbean, Observer, Star, all of those. But there isn't any dedicated space. So I just wanted to create a dedicated space for filmmakers. And that's how Julie Mango came to be. It's kind of like a cheeky play on Rotten Tomatoes because Rotten Tomatoes is also very like Mm. rotten, like actually rotten. But I'm like Mm. something sweet, Julie Mango, you know, my favorite manga. (laughs) So that's where the name came from um, because I was just like something like this, but not so heavy on the criticism because the thing that we want to focus on um, in Julie Mango is talking about the cultural aspects behind the film. Mm -hmm. So um, if you go on the site right now, for example, if you look at the interview that I did with an educator in Jamaica about the flight short film, we talked a lot about like STEM in Jamaica. So um, science, technology, uh, I think engineering and mathematics, how STEM plays out for children in prep school or primary school in Jamaica. So we're really looking at like the culture behind the film and not just saying, watch this film, don't watch it. You know what I mean? Just having a deeper conversation about the things that we cover. That is awesome and definitely needed. (laughs) So I I love the mission and you've kind of been in this content creation and e-com space for a a while. So you have a really good understanding. Yeah, I'm a trained journalist. (laughs) See, 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 that she trained people, she trained for the team. Yeah, but I went all the way around in my career and then came back here to really um, using that skill. Yeah, and I think that's important too. It's a journey for you. 
Um, mm-hmm. And now I think Caribbean filmmakers are doing a lot of work that isn't necessarily highlighted. So that's why mm-hmm. I, I think, you know, I was really excited about this project. Um, there have been a number of Jamaican films that have, you know, done similarly crossed over into to the market. Um, mm-hmm. But this one felt a little bit bigger. It felt a little deeper. Yeah. So. Um, For those of you who are not familiar, Small Acts is a British anthology series, film series, um, created and directed by Stephen McQueen. So he actually has um, Caribbean roots. I believe it's Grenada and... Um, I don't remember exactly what his roots are, but definitely Grenada. Grenada. It's Grenada and another Caribbean island. Um, So the anthology has uh, five films that kind of tell distinct stories around the West Indian community, specifically in London, and it kind of spans over the 1960s to the 1980s. So the series actually premiered at Cannes Film Festival and then got picked up by BBC and then on Amazon Prime. So you and I both watched on Amazon Prime when it did. Yes. The so the the five episodes and I'll kind of go the five films. Um, and I'll kind of go over each. So there's Mangrove, which is about the Mangrove restaurant and the trial of the Mangrove Nine. Mm -hmm. Um, So that has a a bit more of a historical reference timepiece. Lover's Rock, which is like a lover's story, like centered around um, the social scene of of, and music, Lover's Rock. Um, Red, White and Blue, which is about a um, Black officer, Leroy Logan, who became the first Black police officer um, in London. Alex Weedle, who is now a novelist, kind of sharing his story and, and how he kind of came up before he became an author. And then education was, it's really fictional, but really the idea of the educational system of what Black people in London really faced um, during that time frame. And all with a, a West Indian uh, diaspora yes. backdrop. So tell me what, when, when you first kind of saw this coming out, essentially, what were your initial thoughts? Well, I was excited because because it's Steve McQueen, mm-hmm. you kind of already have an expectation that this is going to be good mm-hmm. because we know him from 12 Years a Slave, Widow, some other projects, and his name carries that weight. So you're like, okay, you know that money is going to be behind this project because I think what we're seeing a lot, although there are so many Caribbean films coming out right now, audiences just aren't getting a chance to see them because they go to film festivals and then you might not see them for a while or they might end up on one of the Caribbean streamers. But with something like this, you already knew from you started seeing the buzz about it, especially since they had that deal with BBC that it was going to be something big although we still had some of that like access issues when it comes to people outside of North America and the UK seeing it. Yeah, that was one of the the things that I had realized initially. So I'm thinking, you know, Amazon Prime, it should be available to everywhere that has Amazon mm-hmm. Prime. And actually one of my good friends and pod, fellow podcasters, Odessa, she was just like, I can't watch it because I'm in Jamaica. And I'm just mm-hmm. like, what do you mean? And she's just like, it's not here in Jamaica, so we can't even watch it. And she was, you know, kind of bummed because she grew up in London mm-hmm. um, and really wanted to, you know, see it. I'm not sure if it's available now. Um, But at the time where they were kind of doing that large push um, around it, I I think what kind of drew me in is really um, the title, Small Axe, you know, it's a it's a reference to a Bob Marley song, you know, Small Axe Chop Big Tree. And, you know, it's kind of that that reference around the importance of you know, togetherness in the culture and how, you know, uh, we might be a small axe, but we still can't chop big. Yeah. And we already know we have that power as a region. Right. Right. And what was different to me about this series is um, it didn't focus just on Jamaican culture. It was very Mm -hmm. Caribbean, um, like holistic Caribbean inclusive. And that really speaks to that Windrush generation um, of being, you, you know, you know, going to England from different islands and kind of having that unique experience. And I think it's very similar to, to, to Brooklyn specifically, but a lot of the other pockets outside of the major cities in the diaspora, they're very like specific island, you know, Mm -hmm. um, pockets. Um, Whereas London really had that mix of all of the Caribbean islands. And you really got to see how, 
you know, it played out together. And it reminded me a lot of Roots and not in the same vein, but in terms of importance, I think it's the first time that we're really seeing the Caribbean diaspora diaspora experience in this magnitude. So for me, it was super exciting just to see the promo and I was equally so engaged in the entire series. So the thing that I think too about the importance, and I'm glad you brought up the Windrush because there is a scandal right now or there was a scandal around that time where, I mean, I think it started around 2012, but where people who, because we have to remember that the Windrush generation were invited by the government of the UK to essentially build a country um, and do specific kind of jobs. And I think that's where some of the friction comes in. So people are being sent back now uh, or deported. And it's like, how can you deport a citizen, right? You brought these people here and you gave them citizenship. And still in, I think this was in 2020, we're still seeing issues where Jamaicans specifically were getting sent back to Jamaica. Um, I don't have, I don't remember doing much research on um, whether or not it was because they did something in terms of, because, you know, they, they deport people because of crimes, but I don't think that was the case. Well, so I think- it had a lot to do with lack of paperwork. So essentially they, they were there and not in every case, but in a lot mm. of them, because there, there was no official paperwork outside of this agreement. Um, so a lot right. of, a lot, a lot of, a lot of people who were there were undocumented and I say that with air quotes um but some of them they are they have proper documentation so it, it's like really fuzzy like if mm-hmm. you think about what is happening in the U.S. with immigration and, and what happened with the previous administration um a lot of that is what is kind of still happening a bit in, in, in the U.K. and we both don't live in the U.K. so don't yeah you know, so we don't know the come details. for us we, we don't know all of the details then but essentially but the point is they're wrongfully deporting you know caribbean people. yeah people yeah. of caribbean descent and back so the to timing Ireland. the timing mm-hmm. of small acts is good because after hearing about those things in the news you get to see a different side of uh the conversation to see like that even when they just came although they were invited uh they were treated wrongly and they still are being treated wrongly so i think that's kind of the thing the point that I was trying to make where it's just like it's still relevant all of the films I think including Mm -hmm. education all of them are still relevant and so that kind of stood out to me too in terms of timing and especially because you know in a time where we were doing so much protesting around Black Lives Matter um, a lot of you know the police you know interactions with people Mm -hmm. of color and Black people specifically um, and the struggles around racism I think it was it was super important to really, I'm really big on the idea of the Black experience not being singular to, to just the U.S. So I think it, it really gave a complete understanding of the Black experience in a country that is not U.S.-based. We often hear, you know, a lot of the stories which are super relevant, but we don't always get to hear the stories from other countries, London, Portugal, France, we hear, you know, Nigeria, all of these things were kind of coming to head, India, Mm -hmm. Brazil, like, all of these things are really coming to head in 2020 specifically. So this really kind of capped off the year with an additional Black experience understanding of racism coming up through the years, because I think sometimes a lot of the stories in the media are very U.S. focused. And we always, we get those stories in abundance without understanding the lack of complexities around the other experiences globally. And a lot of what happens in the U.S. really does impact the rest of the globe, just from an inspiration perspective and understanding perspective. And we saw that, especially within the first episode uh, on mangroves so you know they talked about the black panther movement you know in that episode mm-hmm. and how leticia wright's character you know she started that chapter there inspired by what was happening mm-hmm. in the u.s so we're way more connected in this black liberation struggle globally than we kind of are set to perceive. For sure, because even here in Canada during um, all the Black Lives Matter stuff last year is when I really realized like how here 
although we like to think that Canada is so multicultural because that's the marketing and the publicity that the country wants us to believe. Um, it's the racism is here too. And people, there were protests here, there were chapters of BLM here. Um, and there were incidents here that I probably wouldn't have paid as much attention to, if not the and for the environment that last year was kind of the landscape that it was, where it's just like, we're hypersensitive to all of these issues now and they're getting more attention because it's just crazy outside. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so we, we've kind of discussed you know, a little bit about the whole entire project. But what do you think, we were both very disappointed at the accessibility piece. Yes. Um, just because, you know, as diaspora kids and needing to co continue continuously bridge that gap between the region and the diaspora, the diaspora not having access to the, the films really, it, it was a missed opportunity because essentially we missed the opportunity to connect the diaspora okay. with the with the region. So tell me tell me what are your thoughts around that? So I did some research just to make sure that I <laughs> knew what I was talking about because at first I was just like, why? Because this is a thing that I've been seeing with like Netflixes and Amazons and those people, um, those streaming services, right? But then there's an added layer of complexity for small acts in particular because Steve McQueen actually said in an interview that he wanted the BBC to be involved. So he partnered with them for distribution and even production um, because he wanted it to be accessible to people in the UK, not necessarily have to go to a theater to see this or put it on a, another streaming service. So it being on BBC meant that his mother could watch it on her TV, right? And his, in his words, he said he wanted to go where people are. But the thing about that is you're going where I guess your main target audience is uh, people in the UK who can really uh, get a feel for this uh, experience, but the rest of us care too. That's the part where it kind of gets dicey because even the fact that they were able to show at New York, um, New York Film Festival, uh, they had to get permission from BBC uh, based on an interview that I watched, they had to get permission to do that. And then Amazon ends up having limited rights to just North America. Mm -hmm. So that is why um, people, people in France couldn't see it, people in Ireland couldn't see it. Mm -hmm. um, and Ireland's right there. People all over the world, I was looking on Twitter, people asking, adding Amazon and asking, why can't I see this? But I saw one that said, you know, they only have the US rights. Mm -hmm. So I understand that like, for the average viewer who is not in the industry and doesn't necessarily know all the ins and outs of distrib distribution and all of that stuff, it might seem unfair because it's just like, I'm paying the same $9.99 or $12.99 as this person, but I can't access because you think you, are, you have a service that's uh, one service, right? You think you are signing up for a service that I should be able to see this, but then the complexities of how distribution actually works in, I'm going to say Hollywood, even though we're talking about the UK, in that those large systems is the reason why people can't see things mm -hmm. in certain places. And we saw this with Sprinter as well, because even in Canada, we didn't get to see small acts um, right away either. Mm -hmm. They had actually scheduled it for 2021 for um, Canada, but then there was a big uproar why we couldn't see it so somebody did something something happened or something and we were able to see it i think yeah. about a week or two after it released in the u.s Got so it. there's all of these like things that go into the accessibility but it, it's actually an issue that i think it's a larger issue that needs to be addressed and the thing is i don't know who's going to address it because the thing is <laughs> They will say on Netflix, if you go on their website and you go to their like help center and say, okay, why can't I see this in um, my country? They'll be like, oh, well, it's based on tastes and blah, blah, blah. Like they have all these wonderful explanations for why you can't see something somewhere. And they have a whole like Latin America and Caribbean division who's supposed to be looking after our tastes. But when I went on LinkedIn to see who's in, on this team, it's all Latin American folk. There really isn't anyone 
in any of these large organizations that's specifically working for the Caribbean, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? So the ex- we could say, oh yeah, it's just distribution rights, you know, like there it's complex, there are all these things and, you know, you can only get rights to this and that, but there's a bigger issue where it's just like, no one's really going to bat for us when it yeah. comes to these things. No one is. So I don't know. Yeah, you definitely need someone on the inside to kind of push for it. And we, we've seen it with music. Like, you know, Bungie Garland music doesn't end up on the NBA for no reason. <laughs> you know, it's not because they, sometimes it is, you know, they're looking, but sometimes it is an inside person who says, mm-hmm. let's try this or let's do this or there's a market for this. And let's, exactly. you know, that's where the diversity and inclusion part really actually yes. comes in is, you know, we need to just, as much as we are in front, we need to be behind doing the the business sides. Um, So, you know, if you're interested in filmmaking, there are other, you know, you can be in the industry without being a director or writer or actor, Mm -hmm. because there are so many different um, options in things that we need behind the scenes. We need all of it. So (laughs) I think that- And I mean, the Caribbean market, I think if you're thinking on a business level, they might see, oh, the Caribbean is just a small market. It's tiny, you know, they don't really spend a lot of money because that's a conversation that I heard about music too, where I was in one of these clubhouse things where they were talking about the music industry and why why certain things aren't on Spotify and why the the list that Spotify makes about um, dancehall are the way they are. They don't include a lot of people. It's because, you know, they're actually although it's Caribbean, they're actually doing these things for the US, UK market because that's where the money is. That's where the money is, yeah. Right? So, sorry, sorry, you were frozen for a second. So, yeah, so that's where that's where the money is. So although I would love to see the championing of our for our audiences, I know that it's going to be a long haul because our market is small when it comes to dollars and cents sorry was I frozen wait now you're frozen okay now I can hear you and see you did was I frozen the whole time no 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 just 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 on the tail end so it's fine okay all right so I, I definitely hear you in terms of the the small market. It, it's it's like the chicken and the egg. The audience has to you know want the the content, pay for the content, and most importantly, and there needs to be mm-hmm. you know someone behind the scenes really taking an interest on involving and evolving um, the culture. And like like you said, there are a lot of great films that are coming out of the Caribbean. And this, I think, hopefully could be a catalyst to, to, to more, at least straight to, to, to TV kind of distribution. Um, it, it's much more challenging to pack a theater because um, even when Sprinter, which was backed by um, Overbrook Entertainment, I think, um, which is Will and Jada's mm-hmm. company, like I remember buying tickets for a local um showing of that and they had to cancel because a lot of there was there wasn't enough sales for that particular theater and it usually boils down to the same clustered diaspora spaces miami new york um dc and maybe Mm -hmm. la um maybe you know houston if if we're lucky um it's it's specific to to the Mm -hmm. u.s i'm sure toronto's on 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 was on that list too as well um, but you, I, we definitely see that that challenge as a whole. So while the stories are important, it's important that the audience really supports the stories that are being told when they are told. So if you have, if you have access and you haven't watched it, please watch it because that will help. You know, right. uh, the the interest level of of executives behind the scenes, like, okay, what's what's our next small acts essentially, right? And I think the thing with that specifically in terms of like audiences watching, it's such a double-edged thing because a lot of the reasons why audiences don't watch is because there isn't enough marketing dollars behind these films, right? So when titles come out, people don't even know. So it's like 
people, this is the cycle, right? People cuss and said there's not enough Caribbean film, right? So then cuss and then say, oh, there's not enough, there's nothing to watch. Then when something comes out, something comes out, but they don't hear about it. So they're mm -hmm. like, oh, again, there is nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you're trying to, to get filmmakers, filmmakers don't go for their audience. That's the, the next thing in the cycle. Filmmakers don't end up going, putting the, the, the effort behind audience building, not just putting something on Instagram, but actually audience building because they don't know where their audience is. And that's part of the reason why Julie Mango exists as something that I really want to get into in the back end is the data behind it to really mm -hmm. see like who are the people that are actually interested so that I can help filmmakers um, on the island indie side to be able to say okay this is the audience these are things out there like this is how you reach them because you don't necessarily need a ton of money to reach your audience but you're gonna need like strategy and time so mm -hmm. it's this cyclical thing where it's like them don't have time them don't have money them don't know them audience so the audience don't watch a thing and then we're back to the start again where it's just like well Caribbean people don't support Caribbean film because they don't know about it mm. but I, I think a big part of not knowing and I've seen this is when they even even in this in this press run if you look at if you just google small acts and Steve McQueen most of the the media that comes up with interviews is New York Times Rotten Tomato Rolling Stones I don't even really see I, I think the black media in the U.S. they didn't cover it as 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 abundantly as they would have done for a a, a uh, an American made film of this magnitude. So if you, if you remember like, uh, was it Judas and the Messiah? Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of PR done in, in, in the black media space. Whereas I didn't feel like that was the case with this one. And not only is there black media, mainstream media, there's also diaspora, diaspora media, mm -hmm. like local radio, local television, you know, the, the local newspapers. Those are things that, that I think were completely missed. And maybe it did happen in the UK, but for our market, it was really just word of mouth it, it, and, right. and social media is how, you know, this was really distributed um, and, and reached the masses really because yes they did post you know the trailers and about the film but there was no big build up in terms of what yeah. the expectations are I, being able to bring the connection between the black experience in the uk and and tying it into what is happening in the us so for me i think that that was the one of the bigger missed opportunities from a right. media perspective is that build within um, each regional space to really dive in and, and really talk to Steve. Like you don't know much about him outside of the interviews that he has done mm -hmm. um, and the videos that he has done. But if you think about a normal run for any movie, they're doing every video, every press opportunity, every yeah. interview. And that just didn't happen in this, in this case in particular. Right. Cause I was wondering the same thing yesterday when I was doing some research, I'm like, okay, who did they invite in terms of media? Did they invite, like you said, black media? And I just like, I mean, we don't know, but I'm wondering if his, if the publicist even thought about that. that I, you know, I read on Essence that they did do a Zoom. So it sounded like they had, you know, like a, a, junket. Press, a, vir a virtual press junket, if you will. Yeah. But usually what follows that is more storytelling. Like right. actors didn't do interviews. And we, we know John Boyega, we know, um, Latisse, Michael right? Ward, we know yeah. Michael Ward. We, you know, these are you know actors that are really cornerstones in the project, and they didn't do any interviews on on, right. on this project that I saw anyway. Yeah, because I the ones that I saw where they had um, uh, the cinematographer, the exec director, Steve McQueen, uh, Michael Ward was there. Letitia wasn't there. John wasn't there, and two other actors they had. It was a BAFTA thing. So again, that was a UK based thing. I didn't really see a lot of, I mean, I did read some interviews from, like you said, the bigger, wider, um, like New York Times did an interview. Mm -hmm. There are some people that did interviews, like Bustle even did an interview with one of the co the costume director the designers. Mm -hmm. But like you said, there wasn't a lot of where like, you would have a junket where the act is just the actor and they get to talk to the different uh, publications. Yeah. yeah. There wasn't a lot of that.
Yeah, for sure. Definite miss. Um, I think what we did see was a lot of focus on um, racism and, and mm-hmm. that was really the backdrop of, of the entire, um, series. And while that was a huge part of the challenges, I think, you know, you and I kind of spoke about that, that community connection that yeah. really wasn't as emphasized and, you know, being Caribbean people, especially in the diaspora, there's so much community that happens. Um, mm-hmm. and that to me was a, even as equally big of a theme as the racism part, yes. but let, let me know your thoughts in terms of the connection. Yeah, I, I do have a lot of thoughts about it. And the first thing that I realized after rewatching it so that we could chat is that you see it in Mangrove because Mangrove is a bit earlier um, than some of the others where the community is so tight. It To me, it wasn't, just about uh, the nine and what happened after the riot. To me, I was paying attention to the restaurant and the restaurant as a place of safety, as a place that you can go in if you're just if you had just come to the UK, you can go to say, okay, my people are here. And as you mentioned, it's not just Jamaican people; it was people of all Caribbean heritage or Carib- um, from different countries. Mm-hmm. So that was really to me as like the first film and I think Steve said in a couple interviews that he really wanted that to be the first one and it did set the tone for like this is a community of people that have a shared experience not just the fact that they're all new here but shared in terms of food in terms of you saw the panning in the street in mangrove right you saw I mean the challenges that they're going through and also just the history like talking about different historical things um inter-island or inter-country so I think that was a good um I guess foundation to kind of start on because you see it kind of deteriorate a bit in terms of that everybody dealing with the one issue thing Mm -hmm. kind of dissipates when you go throughout the film so like in education this mother is dealing with her child on her own not even her husband is involved as much as her even though she herself was kind of like I'm working two jobs just go to school right that was kind of the relationship you see a a more modern relationship there and Mm -hmm. the little boy Kingsley had to really rely on his sister to kind of vent to so although the community activist came in at the end it really showed you that the organic community aspect that we saw in Mangrove where it's just like because we share the space at the restaurant and this is somewhere where we come to Lyme and socialize and stuff like that because we already have that built-in connection where we actually have time to socialize with each other um them helping each other was more organic whereas you see how the lady had to go undercover to even find Kingsley and other students um other West Indian students in the schools it, it was more of like you had to, it's a more of an individualization. So mm-hmm. although they had that meeting in the uh, the town hall and then they had the stat desk school, it still is more modern in terms of we're all living our lives just to, to live. Like we're mm-hmm. struggling just mm-hmm. to live. Because I think about that a lot when we just moved to Canada. When we were in Jamaica, when I looked at my dad, my dad to me was more social. He was in this club and that club. He was in a photography club because he's a photographer. He was in a, he had a darts club. He played badminton. I used to go to my, with my dad to all of these things. I would go to Alpha with my dad and mom on, during the week after work. They had, because they both worked at BOJ, they had things that they did there. So I saw my parents be way more social mm-hmm. when we were in Jamaica versus when you come to Canada, Yes, you know, we'll have, my dad always has a um, a barbecue uh, for Labor Day, but that's one of the only times you really, he really gets to see his, all his friends come together. Mm-hmm. So there's a thing when you come to, from a small country to a, a large one like this, where you're so spread out, everybody's spread out, they may live in different cities and might, your best friend might be an hour away from you. Mm-hmm. Um, you're see, I think in education, you, you then kind of saw that more like modern thing where it's just like, everybody's just living their own life. You might not talk to your people, them, you know what I mean? The mother didn't really have friend support is what I'm mm-hmm. saying. Versus in Mangrove, we were seeing more of like, something happened everybody know about it everybody's there ready to help out 
-hmm. so that was one of the things that I saw in terms of like the deterioration among the films as like we got from the earlier years to the later years Mm -hmm. that's a great observation because I I, especially now that you're bringing it up I do kind of notice it but I also I also think that it the work life had changed you know the the intensity of when you first arrive and the expectation is very mm-hmm. different and then as you kind of grow as you know our parents generation kind of grew you know I was a latchkey kid you know I see my mom in the morning see my, my mom in the evening and then right. you know as we got older that kind of changed but by that time you know the community had gotten a bit smaller and a little bit exactly. more close-knit and I think so much happened in between those years that it literally just wore them down as people to just like, I don't even have time for the things that are right in front of me, let alone the social aspect. Exactly. But when we do get to the social aspect, it's like you pick pick up where you, you kind of left off. But I do agree. And, and, and it's something I think we can all kind of take notice of it and just think about because you know you go from hanging out like every weekend or every other weekend and now like we just don't like that just is not what we do anymore and and even you know for self that that just doesn't happen either so um that that was a definitely a great point um so we've we've been talking about all these things I want to hear what were some of your favorite moments from from the anthology series Ooh, I mean, it was hard. <laughs> it was it, uh, it was hard to watch. I don't want to go too much into Lover's Rock because we're going to talk about it later, but that was like their favorite moments there. But in terms of the others, it was good. I think the thing that I take away, it's good to see this. My, I can't even necessarily pinpoint moments because I was just soaking everything in and like, okay, the relationship between, um, I think it was Leroy and his father, mm-hmm. uh, when the when father, the you could, <laughs> yeah, and you can see that like, in red, white, and blue, mm-hmm. the father really came from a place of hurt. So just seeing the relationships, I think that, that was my favorite thing. And this is why I, I really like talking about this because just seeing the relationships that we all kind of know, we all kind of see that, like, I can pinpoint that car- that relationship between like a Caribbean mother and father or, um, or father and son, where it's just like, he told, he said to his father, you wanted us to be more British than the British in terms of like the assimilation, you know what I mean? But the father wanted that because he just, didn't want them to have to go through the struggle the man was just parking his truck and them come for him you get what I'm saying like he wasn't doing anything wrong when they beat him in the street Mm -hmm. so just seeing the different relationships and I mean of course seeing the fashion was fun seeing all of that stuff was good and um the way that they use the home where it's just like there's so many times where you see the front room being used for so many different things right you see the front room as a place to meet when you're doing your activism as a place to have um to play scrabble that scene was funny to me where they were playing scrabble um and the man said sex (laughs) (laughs) and the man had the wife yeah he had the wife to make it sexy and he said no no sex in my house even though they were already married you know so those little it's a little things those little nuances I think were were my favorite things to see those like little little things where it's just like yep that's a very Caribbean thing them don't want to talk about sex (laughs) even though you're married you're not having sex so don't even put that on the board you know so stuff like that yeah I agree I I enjoyed the balance of of and it's very true to our people as a culture I like the balance of importance and a lot of education and understanding, mm-hmm. but there were so many lighthearted moments. Like I remember yeah. in, in Alex Weedle's episode and he's like learning how to walk like a real bad man. Yeah. And like, just him, I like, that was just so comedic to me, but for him, it was like a real thing. And, mm-hmm. you know, that is something like, it's like a coming of age 
of this, you know, mm. young teenager who just never learned how to do, he had no influences, you know, positive influences. And, you know, he just had this odd thing about him. And then when he's learning how to like walk like a bad man down, he's like, no, I'm not, I'm not walk down the streets with you. I look so yeah, I feel kind of cool down the thing. And it, yeah. you know, those are the moments that I, I think it kind of balanced out yeah because it was heavy Um, because it was very they were all very very heavy and Mm -hmm. as as jovial as as lovers rock was there were some real intense scenes Mm -hmm. there's you know a rape about to happen and it Mm -hmm. being stopped you know being alone on the street and being the only black person and you know Mm -hmm. those, those sorts of moments they were very strong moments to the culture um that we have a a a a visual understanding to now because mm-hmm. you know you and I are yeah you know, we and are that's the next generation so at exactly. least we we saw it from a different perspective and exactly. I'll talk about it more in our next episode um but those were kind of some of my favorite moments but um for me do you have any last you know thoughts about the series and what do you hope to see next um in terms of just the industry um I, I feel like Personally, I'm like, they could do a small act for like New York, Toronto, <laughs> and yeah. you know, the stories would be slightly different, but there, there would be some similarities, but then some, yeah. some distinct differences um, that I think would be really cool to see. But I mean, I'm, I don't think that that's going to happen, but you know, I think it would be cool. Yeah. It's like I mean, a series, right? Yeah. So I think the, the thing that I would want to see come from it is more, not necessarily another small acts but more directors of that that carry the weight that Steve McQueen carries to really say okay I'm gonna do this cultural work right because a conversation that I keep having over and over especially when um, I talk about like actors and stuff like that um, in a be discovered context is that it's hard to wear your heritage on your chest when you're trying to survive in a Hollywood system, right? And I'm, and when I say Hollywood, I include the UK um, in, in a large system like that because as an actor, as a director, you're really trying to just get your, I mean, directors have way more say in things, but not when you're trying to necessarily sell, sell to a studio. So as somebody in the industry in like a North American context, you you're really trying to, to move your career forward. And a lot of time heritage work doesn't get you there. So a lot, a lot of times you'll see it with actors mostly where they don't even put their heritage or that they can do this accent on their resumes, which I think is a big, big mistake. Even if you are going for roles that are more generic, still put that you can do the accent because as we know, you're gonna see some fake accents and things so at least put it there so that your agent knows so that if something comes across their desk and if they're calling for a native Jamaican accent we can actually get you in there mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. so the thing is so an actor or a director when they get to the point in their career where they are bigger than boss or whatever you want to call it right where they're actually making money from their work now I would like to see them do what Steve did and switch back and say okay now let me create something now that I've made it in this system and I know it's very hard and there's a whole lot of complex things on the back end in terms of business and like getting the money to get things made but if you have it if you can sell something something that's a cultural work please do it like I'm begging you (laughs) you know what I mean that's what I would like to see more people with names because if you if you really look at how many celebrities um act that even have production companies that have Caribbean heritage if those people got together they could make something you get what I'm saying mm-hmm. I'd also they love could, to see like they, more from the region in terms of you know series and shorts and like we're very music news heavy um, but just you know we do a lot of plays but mm-hmm. those don't turn into sitcoms or, you know, I, I think there are maybe a handful. Um, I've only seen a, a very small handful, but I think we have this idea of, okay, we have this idea and it has to go, it, it has to be big or it's nothing. 
Um, yes. So I think the idea of like webisodes, web series, um, and really building on that, like taking a, 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 a page out of Issa Ray's kind of book, of build where you are, and then someone will notice you because the, the quality of the content is there and there's no shortage of talent to pull up. Right. I mean, we see music videos, like, but music videos aren't even watched in the same way that they are 10, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so you can translate that cinematography look of a, of a five minute video into a much larger project. And I know, uh, you know, I'm, I'm saying this and it takes a lot and it costs a lot. Um, and I think that there's more support needed regionally to, to support filmmaking as an industry. And I think coupled with what you just said, as well as the industry's interest in more creative ways to, to, to show the culture and the content in a modern and a historical reference way, those two things will kind of really allow for, you know, this synergy of, of growth for Caribbean um, film as a whole. Yeah, I have some thoughts on that too, because I am trying to be very careful <laughs> when I kind of take that kind of stance now because of, because I'm realizing that there is a lot of, there's a lot of work coming out of the Caribbean and, and there are organizations that are trying to help yeah. filmmakers get to, in terms of production. I think my, I agree with you, but I think where we need to see investment is in distribution and marketing mm -hmm. because people are doing what you're saying people are creating with the little that they have there are a lot of shorts and this is a thing you're not going to see the shorts in a palace mm -hmm. or the other one right you're not going to mm -hmm. see them in the local theaters because they're short i mean they can show them before a i only usually that. see shorts at film festivals Right. And that's, honest. and yeah. that's part of the problem. So yeah. what I think can happen is think about hair love as an example, hair love, even though it's American, that was played in front of another film, another animated film for the same audience, right? In the Caribbean shorts can be shown if shorts are shown by the exhibitors in front of a feature film, that's a similar genre, then mm -hmm. that will help with the larger problem that we have where that cycle that I was talking about, where uh, filmmakers can't promote their stuff, they don't have no money, they don't have no links, they don't have all of this stuff. Um, and people think there are no good, because they like to say, oh, Caribbean films are low quality. No, they're not. No, they are they're not. not. Not at all. There are some brilliant work. It's just that yeah. they're short. So because mm -hmm. they're short, they don't know exhibitors going to say, me buy this, because there's there's not a lot of money that can go into something that short. So if they sh if they figure out a model to show those shorts after they have done their film festival runs, because sometimes filmmakers hold back stuff because they want to apply for more film festivals. So after they've done their film festival run, show them in front of actual feature film that you know that's going to be big, that will help the industry, right? And it won't necessarily cost much extra. It's just a little bit of time because some of them are like five, six, seven minutes. I mean, you have some that are longer that are around half an hour. That would need a bit, a little bit more of a different model because it's taking up more time in the cinema. Yeah. But I think if the cinemas and not just cinemas, cinemas and the businesses, the digicels, the flows, the businesses that are making money off of the region, if they actually go in and support these in different ways, have different experiences where it's just like, it doesn't have to be a film festival, but you can integrate um, a film into different types of events, if mm -hmm. you get what I'm saying, mm -hmm. right? There's mm -hmm. so many different, it just have to be creative. There's so yeah. many different creative ways that films can be shown to wide audience. This is different, but like, there also is way, are ways, sorry, that you can think about films in the way that you think about music in terms of live events. You get what I'm saying? There, there are different little things that we can do, but it will take an investment from, again, like I said, the exhibitors and also the corporations that mm -hmm. are making money off of the audience that these filmmakers need. Mm -hmm.
I, I agree. And I, I think that's the, the educational points that you kind of just pointed out is the importance of Julie Mango TV as well. You know, it's to point out what those opportunities are, especially um, whether it's in the region or the diaspora. Because I think it's it's kind of relatively, un- you don't know what you don't know until you can exactly. kind of see the, the options in front of you. So I think that that's great. So um, any last words before we, we close off this episode? Um, no. <laughs> Watch no? more Caribbean film. <laughs> no, seriously, I. <laughs> so, um, I always want to shout out like the streaming services. So, I don't know if we can maybe link this in the show notes. Yep, we can. Um, I have an article that talks about the streaming services. So, if you are interested in watching more Caribbean film, uh, there are streaming services that you can um you can have a free trial for them. We actually do a giveaway each month to give um two people three months um three month subscription to one of uh, three of those uh, streaming services because we can gift them. So I just want people to know that there are places that you can watch Caribbean film if you want to. And um, we'll link that because I think it's just very important for people to just know you can you can watch good quality films. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rachel. This was so much fun. And you're going to be back for the next episode. So we'll we'll have some fun there. So thank you, uh, Rachel. We'll include all of your information on the show notes, as well as uh, a link to the article that you just spoke of. And you know, that's it. Leah, tell me peeps. All right. Thanks for having me. All right. Let me stop recording so we can do it on two separate files for Carrie. Thanks for listening to the latest episode of the Style and Vibes podcast. If you like what you hear, and I know you do, share it with your friends and family. If you want more, make sure you visit stylingvibes.com and follow us on our social channels, Twitter and Instagram at Style and Vibes. Until next time, Leah Tommy Peeps.